we are going to get going, just waiting on the signal, just waiting on the okay. We all okay? No? Yeah? Yes. No. Yes. Those are thumbs, not middle fingers. So <laughs> so I think, I think we are all good. Um, all right. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself for us? Sure. Hi. Uh, I'm Sam, and hopefully you can hear me because I'm making tongue love to this microphone. And uh, yeah, so I spent 15 years uh, in open source. I spent the last four years running uh, an open source email marketing tech company called PHP List, which some of you may have heard of. And um, yeah, I'm a big fan of decentralization and open source, open standards, uh, work for FSFE promoting that. And today I'm going to be telling you what I know about email, where it's come from, where we are today, threats, and uh, what I hope will be an optimistic future. So let's get going. What makes a good messenger? What makes for a good messaging app? This is a really interesting question, right? Because there have been literally hundreds of messaging applications which have come and gone over the last 50 years, uh, both proprietary and open source. And um, I actually only have two hands, so I'm going to have to alternate between these devices. But when we look at the list of proprietary messaging applications which we are already familiar with, there is better, OK, then we will see many that we're familiar with depending on how old you were when you gained your digital stripes. Uh, you may have been familiar with AOL Instant Messenger, Google Wave, uh, Google Plus, BlackBerry Messenger. That was a big one, right? Everyone thought that was going to be around forever. Um, Groove, Twist, ICQ. My girlfriend uh, met her first partner that way. MSN Messenger, Viber, all sorts. Uh, proprietary messaging apps which have come and gone, many of them with a lot of investment, many of them which their firms and their shareholders of their firms believed were going to be the next big thing, and for some of them actually were the next big thing for a good chunk of time. But we here, we are a, a more enlightened audience now, right? We're more pro open source, so we're probably more familiar with some on this list which uh, have yet to achieve global domination. My definition of success and failure for the purposes of these slides is something which um, is achieving like a global scale and which has stood the test of time. So let's say at least five years. So uh, I used to be an avid uh, Contalk user, Diaspora, Pump, like about uh, 10 years ago, I was uh, big into these things and using them for messaging and hoping that enough other people would adopt them that I could use them as my primary messaging applications. But they didn't last so well. I don't know how familiar you are with Hemlist, which uh, never actually got to the light of day, or Project Appleseed, some of these others, Mumble's still a thing. But even the open source messaging applications, sorry? IRC, yeah, IRC is very close to my heart. I don't know what Slack's offering that they're, they're not personally, but yes, IRC, absolutely, taught me how to code. Um, so whether proprietary or open source, it's really tough to make messaging applications which succeed, we've seen. And there's, there's all sorts of reasons for that which we're going to dive into now. Um, email, on the other hand, something about email which has really made it different. 103 trillion messages estimated to be sent every year using email. 103 trillion. Uh, as the talk of this title says, uh, 3.8 billion users. Those are unique users, right? That's uh, to compare to Facebook's 2.4 billion uh, users that they, they currently have. Email, um, yeah, it's still rising in popularity, estimated 6% uh, new users in 2019. It's basically the undisputed king of digital communication. Uh, in fact, earlier this year, um, the Wall Street Journal saw fit to describe email as the hot new channel for reaching real people. That's in, in January, right? So uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's a thing. And, you might be thinking to yourself, well, yeah, but they're talking about email in terms of email marketing, and that's different to my use case. Like, email marketing is maybe a separate animal, and you're kind of right, but the fact that email is uh, so popular for, for marketing tells us a few things, right? Um, firstly, like, email is still number one, like, consistently ranked number one for return on investment for digital marketing spend, and that tells us that people are engaged with that content and they're acting on that content, so marketing does tell us something about how successful communications platforms are, because people, basically companies don't spend billions of dollars on uh, communications channels that aren't effective. 
And uh, if we look a little deeper, we can also see that actually there's really big business still being done in and around email. Uh, I was talking to uh, some folks here at the front row um, about this talk just before it started, and they described email as an, as an ancient system of protocol, and it is. Like, I mean, 50 years, I think that's, it's fair to say it's ancient for a, for a protocol that we're still relying on. But the fact that in the last seven years alone, there's been 17 billion US dollars spent on mergers and acquisitions of email tech companies says something about the, you know, its, its relevance and its importance strategically. And many of these acquisitions of, of companies uh, in the email space, they're by Facebook, Google, Amazon, Adobe, all these big American tech companies have got into the email game. They've all bought email tech properties during this time because it's really important strategically still. Additionally, uh, there are hundreds of email clients available. Basically, every significant platform has multiple choices of email clients, which is something that we, we take for granted. We don't have multiple choice of clients for other messaging platforms that we use, like LinkedIn Messenger, for example, not viable ones anyway. And uh, yeah, all examples of email really being king of the roost. So why is this? What, what's made it different? It's not just that it was one of the first uh, to, the, to the table. There are specific things. And so I'm going to answer my own question now, like what makes a good messaging experience? Let's start with the user's perspective, right? It's like maybe the most accessible and the easiest to get going with. When we make our own decisions about what email applications we use or what, what messaging uh, platform we would adopt, uh, we need a few things. We, we need a free price tier. Gratis is uh, basically expected um, of, of users uh, for any kind of technology, even B2B technology. People expect a free tier, so we have to have something that's free. We have to have something that's like cheap to, to adopt, something that's easy to get going with. A lot of the, the newer systems, um, some of the open source platforms, they're not so easy to adopt as, as a user. Like they, they require some more technical steps involved. Anyone who's uh, tried using uh, MUT or Asteroid uh, messaging clients will have uh, experience with this. Also, um, the messaging system needs to be easy to switch to from another platform. So it's not enough that if you're a new user, you're welcome, but it also needs to be easy to bring your contacts and content from somewhere else. And uh, also, it needs a critical mass of users. Otherwise, you personally have to advocate to every other one, every other person that you want to communicate with using that, using that system. So we require a critical mass of users so that when you adopt it, it's already there and useful to you uh, by default without you having to put in all the legwork and do the marketing for that system yourself. Um, so that's on the, on the user side. Now, in order to achieve those benefits for the user, there have to be other building blocks in place, and some of these economics. So specifically, um, it has to be like accessible. So the messaging system, it needs to be like available in your region. There has to be a server. There has to be uh, a system that supports where you are and your language and, and uh, be accessible. So that means it needs to be business backed. It means we, we need organizations which are basically vehicles which are sustainable, which will continue to provide this service and continue to deliver good quality service. For there to be businesses interested, we need viable business models to attract those businesses to be involved, and that's a separate thing, right? Um, and additionally, we need an efficient market, which uh, will mean that there's actually competition between different providers of hosting or different clients, so that not only does the messaging system get established and serve users' needs on day one and in year one, but also over time it continues to improve, it continues to use, meet users' needs, that it continues to be adapted to new platforms regardless of like strategic uh, needs of the companies behind them. So like Microsoft might not have invested in making MSN Messenger clients officially for Android because it was competing with that platform at the time. No, we need a, an efficient market of uh, vendors effectively to compete um, to, to continue to serve users' needs. And that means that it needs to be a low barrier to entry for companies that want to produce new clients or new uh, servers in this space, potentially. It needs to be easy for them to get involved, not have to pay license fees, not have to risk getting involved with patent wars, uh, like the Unix wars. And also, it needs to be attractive for them to enter this in the first place, right? So it needs to be not only easy for companies to create new technology and create new services within this messaging platform, but also it needs to be motivating for them to bother to do so. This comes back to the business models, but um, like a monopoly or an oligopoly isn't, isn't really gonna cut it. Uh, it needs to be uh, more efficient than that. So those are the economic requirements. But again, if we step one step behind those requirements, we see that there are in fact technological and strategic requirements for the messaging platform to succeed. 
like technologically, uh, we need freedom of implementation. So it's kind of an obvious one maybe for, for we uh, open source and open standards advocates. But for m the world's leading messaging platforms which are not email, in most cases you don't have freedom of implementation for various reasons. APIs can change, you need licenses, you need API keys, etc. Um, yeah, that means you need freedom over both the client and the server level to experiment and to improve and to hack and to deploy and to localize. Uh, also, there needs to be a separate protocol from the implementation so that the protocol's interests can continue to exist and thrive independent of the client and the, and the server. Basically, we have different stakeholders here because the needs of the protocol can potentially diverge and conflict with those other two groups. And we need extensible functionality. So that can be built into the platform itself. If we think of XMPP, the first X is really important. It's extensible. And there are hundreds of extensions to XMPP, which give us benefits that we take for granted today. Things like the ability to set a custom nickname on your XMPP account, your, your Jabber account, or to have a, a mood or a tune or even an avatar picture. Those are all extensions that were added as innovations additional to the, to the core protocol. So we need the system to be extensible and we need independence from a central authority for, for various reasons, also strategic, also the company can't get bought. When we combine these things uh, together, we see some really important effects, which are the fertile ground that messaging applications need to succeed. More specifically, we see efficient innovation and competition within the messaging ecosystem. So what this allows for is effectively the outsourcing of innovation from one company with one set of finite resources or one organization or even one community to a much broader global community of innovators. That means that people like the audience here at 36C3 can add improvements, they can spot problems and fix them, they can identify security holes and patch them. Basically, they're independent to bring their skills and innovation and resources without there being a bottleneck from a company like Microsoft or Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, yeah both at the client level and at the, the server level, that is, because again, these technologies have different requirements at those levels. Uh, it allows for fast adaptation to new platforms and devices, so quickly we will see the messaging uh, ecosystem extend when new devices and, and operating systems become available and become in vogue, and we can also see high performance products, because ultimately the user remains a customer. We don't end up with a situation which we see so often with proprietary centralized messaging protocols where the user is actually not the person who makes the decision about what application they use which causes, you know, basically the, the interests diverge. No, the user needs the freedom to switch. The server administrator needs the freedom to switch. And the people who develop the protocol also need the freedom to make decisions that are in the best interest of the protocol, irrespective of the needs of those other two groups. These are the effects of the strategic, technological, economic, and user's perspectives that all go together to make what we need for a successful messaging platform. So to boil this down, we have what I would call the magic formula for uh, email success, which is a critical mass of users, uh, extensible functionality, independence of a single authority over the network and also over the technology itself, an efficient market of service providers to continue to compete and produce new innovations and have a good quality service. And actually, if we look at email today, we can see that clearly it has a critical mass of users. It has more mass than any other system. And let's see how it stacks up against these, these other key points of the magic formula. First off, is email extensible? It's ancient, right? I mean, <laughs> when you think of email, you may not think, yes, it's so easy to extend. It's so easy to improve. In fact, one of the criticisms of email I heard again at the beginning of this talk was that, yeah, it's, it's broken in these ways, but nobody seems to know how to fix it, or it's too slow to, uh, to get people to agree to make those improvements. Well, actually, it's super extensible, right? And the fact that here, roughly 50 years after email's conception and initial use, we're still using it. I mean, if you think about that for a second, that tells you just how extensible it must be. So let's even just look at the last 25 years of the use of email for how it's been extended in critical ways that benefit us and allow us to continue to use it. We had the first read receipts in 95. We had attachments and MIME types supported in, in 96. I'll say more about MIME types in a second. In 2000, IMAP extensions became a thing, which made it possible to extend the functionality of the core protocol, much like XMPP is extended in the way that I described earlier. From those XMPP extensions today, we can do server-level searching. We can uh, move mail from one box to another more efficiently. Uh, we can find out the quota that we're, being, that we're using of the disk space, and all sorts of other features we take for granted. In 2001, MIME types were used to support OpenPGP, email encryption. And 2002, we had the first official support for HTML content. 
And that came with tracking pixels, which opened up a multi-billion dollar industry today of email marketing, which many of you will hate, but some of you may also appreciate. It's also roughly the time that MailChimp was founded, around 2000, also PHP List. And in 2004, uh, reader receipts became uh, official uh, through the IETF. And in 2015, we finally got protected email headers. So those of us who are enjoying encrypted uh, email uh, subject lines, we have email's extensibility to thank for that in the last four years. If we look at MIME types alone as one example of how email has been extended successfully, there are today 1,841 different MIME types supporting different kinds of content which can be attached to an email. And if you, you look at how these are categorized, the majority of them are for apps, but we also have 153 audio types, which can be supported natively, like opened correctly by your mail client. And this MIME type system and ecosystem was so successful that it was adopted wholesale by all browsers. So obviously, you know, if you're uh, downloading stuff, if you're using, I mean, any modern web server will be including header information to tell the user and their mail and their web client, uh, their uh, web browser what kind of content should be used using the same MIME type system which has been devised through the extensibility of email. So it's pretty much extensible, I think we can agree. How about the independence of its authority? Well, let's have a quick recap about the architecture. So web is primarily client-server relationship. It's simple, it used to be one way, now it's much more two-way. Every time you request a page, you're sending all kinds of data about yourself, which is patched together as we know and turned into demographic information, solve for marketing and so on. But primarily, it's a simple architecture of server and client. Email is not that way. It requires cooperation between multiple servers, servers, not, not clients, in order to make the message delivered successfully. So we have the sender's mail sent to a mail server that they have a relationship with. That in turn is looked like the address of the recipient is looked up using the standard DNS system. And then the receiver's mail server is contacted. The mail is delivered to them once the they're the user that has a uh, relationship with that mail server is online, then they'll receive their message. Now, this system is fundamentally different, and it has a variety of benefits, benefits that we really take for granted. So it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Again, it requires cooperation between, between servers that we, we don't see with web-based architectures. Um, all peers are fundamentally equal, really important. They just use the DNS system. So long as you have a domain name that can be reached over the internet, you can have a mail server. No other barriers to entering this market. Messages use store and forward as a system. So it's quite resilient. It's asynchronous. It assumes that the network will have problems, that there will be latency issues, that maybe the other mail server won't be available sometime. And it's resilient to that. It will keep your messages happily waiting, usually until the recipient mail server is online again and able to receive the message, at which point that mail server will keep it until the user is ready to download it. Of course, you might be using push notifications, etc. But this is the fundamental architecture. So it's really different to just uh, web-based content. So we have, uh, from that, uh, easy to deploy, easy to set up, and uh, no central authority that can say no. You can set up your own mail server in Turkey, or Egypt, or China, or wherever else technologies are blocked. So we see that we have independence of a single authority achieved as well. Now let's look at the, uh, the last point, the efficient market of service providers. So there are a whole range of different business models based around email. Some of them are newer than others. I'm going to start with the biggest ones. Obviously, advertising is a really big deal here. This is both direct and indirect. So you could look at uh, the success of Gmail as, I don't know, Google, they kind of achieved this quantum leap in their business model, like the, the, the revenue that they could achieve from email by taking a very indirect approach from the data that they got from, uh, from your email, basically. So companies like uh, Hotmail before, they were doing a pretty good job of getting direct uh, advertising revenue by adding adverts to the bottom of your messages and the footer messages and also having banner adverts and so on. Gmail's like, no, let's stockpile this, let's store this, let's use this to build up profiles, make it very indirect. It's less obvious to the user what's happening. It detracts from their experience much less. And they made a bunch of money from it, and they're currently dominating email. So advertising. We have also ecosystem lock-in. That's another big one. So the email address is, is not so much, uh, I mean, the messenger in itself is not providing revenue directly, but it's very indirect. Think of when you need to create a new Gmail account when you first activate your Android phone. It's not a choice. It's something that ties you into the ecosystem. Then you can only receive certain kinds of communications through that. And one step after another, you basically get upsold to more profitable services, whether it be G Suite in Google's case, or whether it be OneDrive or Office 365, and you get pulled into an ecosystem, and they make their revenue from you in other ways. 
Uh, another business model is more direct, more transparent, you might say, to the user, which is a monthly fee. We still see Yahoo Mail Pro, which only launched in 2017, for example, making money out of this. Proton Mail Plus, Colab Now, probably several of you are paying for your services, but unfortunately, history has taught us that most users, like the mass market, they are not prepared to pay the cost of the hosting of their email, which is why this is number three on the business model list in terms of popularity, rather number one or number two. Uh, fourthly, we have it just as a, as a cost center, basically, so it's used to get other things done. It's not really business model per se, but that's how the costs are covered. Uh, and then the last two are to do with like softer forms of advertising, so ISPs, internet service providers. They want to use like the social proof of the fact that you're using them and their services, so they give you a free email address and you advertise to all your friends that you're using them and they think, well, he knows what he's doing or she knows what she's doing, maybe we should use uh, the service that they are. And then finally, we have pay for association. So I just listed these two brands because these are ones I've been personally involved with. But yeah, like when you pay to be associated with something which you view as prestigious, so you can make a donation to these organizations and in return, you'll get an email address or also the Document Foundation is a little bit similar. If you contribute and become a member of the organization, contribute your time and skills, then you get access to one of the email addresses. So there's a variety of different business models here. Um, and that's good, right? That's good for variety. And this is part of the reason why there's such a variety of hosts out there. Because companies like ProtonMail are completely different to, to Google and Microsoft in their business model, in their motivation, and, and how they produce things. Like ProtonMail is investing in making open source PGP clients, for example, which is awesome. They have a, a, a totally different approach, different revenue, and that makes the whole ecosystem more resilient because it means multiple business models here can basically fail for various reasons and email can continue to exist or the messaging platform in question can continue to exist independent. It, it doesn't have a single point of failure as far as the business model or the revenue goes. Now as far as getting started quickly, there's some graphs here based on research that I've done into the use of open source mail clients and the geographic distribution of where mail servers are hosted. And the graphs in the middle are the ones I want you to pay attention to. So the, the vast majority, uh, depending on which data set uh, we're looking at, I've got two independent data sets here. Uh, the vast majority of mail servers worldwide are running open source mail transfer agents. So this is the software that actually sends the, the mail, basically. Uh, most of these are running either um, software called XM or Postfix, both are old, very well established, uh, open source. But we can see like 71%, uh, between 71% and 96% of all mail servers in the wild that are reachable on port 25, they're running open source mail transfer agent software, which is pretty freaking incredible when, when you think about it, right? And this software is obviously free, it's enterprise grade, it's well documented, it's been around a long time. There's 10,000 configuration options, or maybe more like 1,000 configuration options. And long story short, it's pretty easy to get started hosting your own, I mean, relatively easy in the world of other kind of businesses you might want to get into, you can just take software off the shelf, put it on a mail server, scale it horizontally, and provide a service, right? I mean, that, that's, that's pretty great. The tech is free, lots of other people have done it. So this speaks to the ease of entering the market of being an email service provider. You can get this technology off the shelf, and most companies are already doing that with open source software. So we have achieved the magic formula for email, right? This is... Uh, a large part of the explanation of why email is dominant today, why it's been so difficult to dethrone it, and why I don't expect it to go anywhere anytime soon. However, however, uh, there is this thing called uh, centralization, and um, it's a reality. It's a reality for um, a lot of things that we took for granted being decentralized in the past. And that's what uh, these tables speak to. So here we can see the uh, market share in uh, Europe and the United States for mail clients. So it's really important to say these are clients um, rather than mail servers. But if you think about it, you can see there's a close association between the two. And uh, although iPhone is number one as a mail client, Gmail being number two is uh, an indicator of the number of people that are actually using Gmail because most people who use Gmail are not using it um, with some third-party mail server. They're using it with uh, Gmail's own mail servers, whereas most people who are using Apple Mail Client, they're actually using a third-party mail server with that. So Gmail is the one that uh, really jumps out here. And before Gmail, there was no company that had more than 25% market share of email as a, as a service provider, as, a, as, a, as an email hosting uh, company, which, um, which is concerning, and it's a, cons it's, it's a significant change. The 
success of the gratis plans, like Hotmail, which was bought by Microsoft specifically to get control of that large user base uh, back in the in the 90s, um, and also of Gmail uh, being for free, and also if we look in, in Russia, MailRU and Yandex and ones like that, that's what drove the success of the, the centralization of these models, unfortunately. And um, it's actually really interesting, because if we think about what Gmail wants to get out of, uh, so if, sorry, if what Google wants to get out of Gmail, um, yeah, like they haven't had much success actually with, with messaging. They kind of, um, they really, uh, I mean, Gmail is their golden platform uh, as far as messaging goes. And that's also because all these other projects didn't do what they were supposed to do. So some of these you're probably more familiar with others, like obviously Google Wave, Google Hangouts, uh, Google Plus, uh, Google Talk, Google Allo, then maybe some that you might be less familiar with. Uh, the bottom half of the list is uh, companies that Google bought and either tried to run or, or shut down pretty quickly. So Pi, Orkut, Sparrow, uh, Jakku, et cetera. Um, none of these dominated in the way that Google was. I mean, look at the scale that Google operates at, right? I mean, these are, there's actually a, a list of around 160 projects which Google's canceled on killedbygoogle.com, which is a, an interesting uh, read. But when you look at the messengers alone, this is quite some money that they've spent, which hasn't really gone anywhere. And when we compare Google's position to like their biggest competitors in the, the messaging space, we see that they don't have anything to answer to uh, WhatsApp or to Facebook Messenger, actually, um, which is really interesting, or, or to TikTok or, or some of the others in uh, the Asian region. So they're really counting on Gmail. They're, they're trying to take a different approach with rich communication services by basically moving one level up the technology stack and getting other third-party developers to, to implement Google's messaging system for them. But as far as I can see until now, the uptake has been pretty small. So uh, that's an interesting to watch to see whether it pans out. But yeah, I mean, considering Google's position and considering they own the world's most popular smartphone OS, it's kind of interesting they don't have a messaging app that uh, anybody uses, basically. So Gmail's really important for them strategically in this space. And, and understandably, they've been working to expand their, their position and their, their control of, of email as a, as, as a medium. They might not frame it that way, but that's certainly how it looks to those of us um, in the open source space. So um, when we look at what, uh, what some of the effects of uh, email being uh, centralized are and some, some of the risks to us as users, we see that we, we lack basic support for a bunch of stuff. Like those of us who've done web development in the past, we're familiar with the pain of having to support Internet Explorer. Um, anyone who's uh, had to support um, like email design or done email development will know that Outlook tends to f like fill the same space still. So great, you know, yay that we've got rid of Internet Explorer 6 is something we have to support, but oh no, we still have to support Outlook for, for our email designs, which really sucks, uh, sucks pretty bad. And we're still lacking support for really basic things. I mean, most CSS3 features or uh, even linked files are not supported by uh, either Outlook or, or Gmail uh, at the moment. Uh, JavaScript, SVG, uh, HTML canvas. I mean, some of you will probably think, actually, you're really happy that there's no JavaScript and SVG in your emails. But you know, like uh, it, once you start receiving more engaging, more dynamic content, um, you know, which is more responsive, more pixel perfect, which you know basically uses open standards, which work well across devices and platforms and resolutions, then you probably will be grateful for things like HTML canvas in your email inbox. But uh, it's very hard to get around these big players, which have centralized like con control over such a large percentage of email inboxes when you want to push technology forward in, in the email space. And um, not only is it like affecting the user-facing features and, and things like what content we can send each other with, within mail, um, but also it makes email much more vulnerable to being blocked in a way that it was designed to be resilient to in the first place. Like we saw how by default it uses DNS, it's resilient, it's distributed. But when so many people are using Gmail, for example, um, all you have to do is uh, block specific IPs or specific domains, and all of a sudden, Gmail goes down for people who need to use it and rely on it. So in 2012, Iran blocked uh, Gmail, 2014. China blocked all Gmail traffic, 2018. Russia did, and I'm sure in future, we will see Gmail being blocked again, which is something that just isn't really possible, at least not with the same ease and with, with the same like approach if you're using email among a variety of hosts, domains, and, and mail servers as it used to be. Now, additionally, um, Gmail has benefited from uh, the openness of SMTP and IMAP as standards, like the fact that they can just support these protocols and they can welcome with open arms lots of these users. Basically, they benefit from the low uh, market entry barriers that I mentioned before. Like, it's been easy for them to become an email service provider. But actually, now they say they're going to drop support for IMAP effectively uh, in 2020. 
because they, uh, their, their reasoning is that um, basically using Gmail logins directly is insecure. So anywhere that you can't use OAuth for your Google credentials, they're going to drop support for, and that includes IMAP, which means that although they've been able to harvest a good chunk of the uh, global uh, user base of email by saying, hey, come, you know, you can use your own mail server, you can use your own uh, existing domain uh, aliases and what have you, you know, we support IMAP. Um, you know, it's a kind of a transparent system that they're providing. Now that they've reached a certain critical mass, it looks like they're actually cutting off. So they've, they've used IMAP as a, as a, to, to benefit them, to increase their market share, and now that they've got it, it looks like they're going to shut it off once again. So it's going to be interesting to see if they go ahead with this, but this is what they've announced they're going to do, uh, shutting off support for uh, direct IMAP login. And additionally, um, they're they're trying to address some of these, uh, these issues with lack of support for more dynamic email content. Um, but in typical Google fashion, dare I say, or, or maybe let me rephrase that, they, they have a history of doing it in this way. Um, they're not doing it through an existing standards body. They've basically launched something that's proprietary, and then they've said, oh, whoops, people care about governance. Let's pretend we have some governance. And that's what they're in the process of doing right now. Um, having a, uh, They just introduced recently a technical steering committee for accelerated mobile pages, which basically includes five of their friends. And uh, this is um, a great leap forward in terms of, so for those of you who aren't familiar with accelerated mobile, for mobile pages for email, it's a subset of HTML, which is proprietary, which allows you to have more dynamic content within your emails, more interactive content. Um, but it's controlled by Google. And uh, as I say, it's a proprietary standard. And in order to even use accelerated mobile pages for email, you have to register with Google. You have to have a track record of sending the kind of content that they like. You have to have been sending to Gmail um, and uh, yeah, meet some other criteria, which doesn't look very independent from, to, to me. So as far as the centralization um, perspective goes, they certainly are uh, making some strong moves. And the effects of the centralization on the economic model that has allowed email to grow and remain competitive as an ecosystem is that we lose a lot of those business models, uh, those revenue streams, uh, which we talked about earlier. So the, the, the ones which remain viable primarily are indirect advertising revenue, ecosystem lock-in, and as a cost center which cuts out a lot of those other smaller email providers. Um, if you're wondering how Gmail centralizing uh, email threatens Colab and ProtonMail, well, uh, because Gmail makes it consistently like more difficult to get mail delivered, right? You have to jump through more hoops. You have to play by their rules. You have to basically second guess what their policies are and how they're changing. Register with Gmail and make sure you have IPs that they like and so on. So they make it more and more difficult to actually get delivered and they can dictate what it takes to get an email delivered. It's no longer the flat playing field that it used to be. Not all mail servers are going to be equal. Domains have reputations. IPs have reputation with, with Gmail that they don't have elsewhere. And if they want to block your traffic or permanently put it in a folder which someone's never going to read, there is really not much you can do about it. Um, so it threatens the business models, unfortunately. However, email does remain uh, alive and well. And there are some interesting innovations that I would like to share with you. The spirit is certainly not dead. Um, there are some exciting. Uh, things for developers like MGML, which is another approach to making uh, email content easier to produce. This actually came out of a European startup, Mailjet, and it's a bit like jQuery was for uh, HTML and JavaScript back in, I don't know, the, the early 2000s, and that it's, uh, it's basically a simple way to generate content which is compliant with all uh, mail clients. Uh, so you can write once and generate content which will uh, adapt, so it's an abstraction layer. Um, Mailvelope, probably you're familiar with, makes P open PGP encryption uh, easy as a, as a web mail solution. Uh, chat over IMAP. So this relates also to Delta Chat. Uh, hands up anyone who's using Delta Chat. I see four. That five? Nice, nice. Awesome. So for those of you who don't know, Delta Chat is uh, basically an attempt to implement a WhatsApp-like chat interface on top of IMAP leveraging the benefit of these 3.8 billion users and all the architecture that's there to provide a kind of chat experience that people expect from modern chat applications without having to rely on proprietary tech stack. And chat over IMAP, chat over IMAP is the other one I was referring to and promised to tell you at the end. That is being developed by Open Exchange, pretty well-funded organization. They have some nice videos and website. Um, Delta Chat is, uh, these are both open source, by the way. Delta Chat is already in the App Store. You can try it out. I recommend you do. 
uh, give it a go. I think it's beta status. Chat over IMAP is in development still, but they're investing pretty heavily in it. JMAP is another cool um, development that uh, actually just got standardized this summer. It's uh, aiming to be a replacement for IMAP over JSON, so it's uh, solving some of the issues uh, that people see with IMAP and making it more um, performant for mobile platforms and yeah, solving a lot, a lot of issues that they, they see and I think it's a really nice project. Wild Duck is a, uh, it's a new um, like technology stack written from scratch over the last two years. It's kind of a replacement for those older systems like uh, Dove Postfix combinations. It uses Node. Uh, uses other technology as well, but it's an example of something that's actually really hard to do, which is write a new piece of enterprise-grade infrastructure, um, like fr from scratch. Like it's a, it's a new player in the field. It's a new modern player, and at that level of infrastructure, that's that's really significant, and we need more of that. It shows that there's still enough demand and investment in the ecosystem for that kind of thing to happen. Superhuman, some of you may know, it's beloved of uh, CTOs and CEOs. It's an email automation system. It's proprietary. Got a lot of buzz. People swear by it. People are prepared to pay, I think, 20 bucks a month or so to have this service sort their email for them automatically, generate reminders, and so on. This is innovation on the user-facing side. Uh, Juicy Mail is a new mail client, uh, I think uh, 2019. Also, Blue Mail is another new mail client. They're both proprietary, but still, there's people who are investing in these mail clients on different platforms, proving that the business model uh, is still working for them, or at least they expect it to. AMP Email is problematic in the way that I've said, but it is also an innovation. It is centralizing, but it is also changing what you can do with email. So, you know. That's uh, it's a complex relationship I have with that. And then Zapier is also really interesting. So those of you who, who may have used Zapier in other places, uh, Zapier actually does allow you to do a lot with email. Uh, growth hackers, uh, chief marketing officers, they love automating their mail workflows with Zapier. You can automatically detect content, put it into this system, like put it into your CRM, uh, extract leads or inquiries. Like um, anytime somebody messages you on LinkedIn in mail and you get an email notification, you can set a trigger that will mean that that messages you on Slack or various other things quite easily using uh, Zapier without doing any coding. So that fits in nicely to the email ecosystem as well. And finally, there's this project called Lightmeter, which I personally am working on. What we're aiming to do with Lightmeter is make running a mail server easy again by automating and monitoring what your mail server is doing. We're starting out by supporting Postfix, and secondarily, it will be Exim mail servers. Um, Yesterday, one of the tweets from the attendees here at uh, CCC said that they wouldn't wish maintaining a mail server on their worst enemy in response to one of my tweets. Uh, that's kind of the problem that I'm aiming to solve with this and um, with our project. It's open source uh, forever. It gives you a dashboard, what's going on with your mail server, and should make it as easy to deploy a mail server and operate it as if you had no experience running Postfix at all. So this is my contribution and my next project in this space. So that's actually it from me. Um, I tried to cover both the past, the present, and uh, future directions for email. And uh, if you want to find me, I'm there on the left. If you want to follow what we're doing with Lightmeter, the contact details are there. The first Hello World tweet went out today. Thank you. No time? No? OK. So I'll take questions off stage. Thanks. Yes, sorry, we are past time uh, to let our volunteers go live their lives. So Sam, we'll go ahead and take questions off stage. I'm sure you are going to swarm him. Very charismatic, handsome guy. You have to see him up close. If you haven't, you haven't gotten the real deal. Um, so he's going to be over here. Uh, this is it for us for today, guys. Day three, a great success. Thank you all, audience, for coming in and out, watching the talks. I want to give a great thank you to our volunteers, sound, video, uh, the assemblies back there, all the uh, speakers and the workshop runners. You guys make this, uh, <coughs> you guys make this cluster what it is. Sorry, I'm getting all choked up. <coughs> Not for reasons because I appreciate what they're doing, but because there's something in my throat. So <laughs> I would like to ever, uh, let's give Sam one last big round of applause. Let's give our volunteers a round of applause. Uh, that's it for us. We will be back tomorrow with more content. Go to decentral.community to see our schedule. We have more workshops. We have more talks. And then C3 is over. It's uh, it just begun, but it's already almost over. So be free. Fly away, my little butterflies.